All right, I'm just going to do a walk around to this uh, Gorton 122. Um, this is primarily for the purpose of, uh, I've uh, got a guy down in Ohio that's uh, interested in buying this machine. I'm trying to make space for the new stuff that's coming in. But uh, I thought, you know, it'd be easy for him to see a walk around if I put it on YouTube channel. And there might be something else somebody else sees here that interests him. So this was originally set up as a trace master, so it was a hydraulic tracing machine. And it had, over on this side, um, an arm that came out that had the uh, stylus, I think they call it, on it. And uh, I pulled that off because I'm right-handed. Well, I had no use for any of that. And the only quill handle is this one here, and that's not so handy. And I like quick handles, so I took that off and made an adapter up stuck on there it's a little hillbilly i'm gonna admit like at the time all i had in my shop was an ac buzz box stick welder so not proud of that weld but uh, it's on there and it worked um so anyways i stripped off the hydraulic stuff it has still got the motor mounts um it's got ball screws on x and y it's really slick it's got these nice accordion covers um, I left the mounts with the idea that if I ever had the time, I would do a two-axis CNC conversion. Now, on this side, I didn't ever bother pulling the hydraulic motor. The reason I did on that side is this knob right here disengages the hydraulic motor, and that one, there was something wrong with it. It wouldn't disengage, so when you were cranking the X-axis, you were dragging the hydraulic motor along, and it made so much extra load, you could hardly turn it. But uh, anyway, really slick. It's got front controls. Um, this runs to two sets of bevel gears to go over there, but I'll show you. So because it's ball screws and because this thing is so minty new, we've got, it's hard to see if I can get it to focus, half a thousandth worth of backlash, and that's all in the uh, bevel gears. You can see, you look here at the ways, this thing is like brand spanking new. Um, I've got no backlash in uh, the y-axis at all. And all of that is because, so this was the original purchaser, uh, Medical Research Program, VA Hospital, Hines, Illinois. My understanding was that it got used little or possibly even nothing by those guys, that it was in some kind of government storage program, and that it got through one of those, I don't understand it, programs where uh, higher education institutions can get... Uh, military surplus stuff for free or close to it it got purchased by muskegon community college or donated whatever it was that happened and that they powered it up for like one week demoed it to their students said you're never going to use one of these things this is outdated would have been in the early 80s and my understanding is this is like a late 70s model probably one of the last tracers that was built anyways and then a friend of mine bought it from an auction at muskegon community college and that was Oh, sometime, I guess, in the 80s. He had it in storage for a long time. When I got it, couldn't move it. I have never completely cleaned it up. Uh, this is still remnants of the, like, cosmoline junk that's on it. And you can see, like, that's what's on here. I can scrape it with my thumb. I never completely stripped it off because my last shop was a very damp environment. And honestly, I didn't want to see the machine get wrecked. So I cleaned off the top of the table just the stuff that I had to in order to use it. Um, and then never finished stripping the rest of the rust inhibitor off from it. So anyways, what I did is I took the uh, side cover off. It has an oil pump inside the knee with an oil reservoir. Dug all the sludge out of there. Cleaned the oil system. Put new oil in it. Um, and got it freed up. But it's still got this crazy quirk. Where like right now you can see, okay, I can move the quill. It's sticky, but it moves. Um, they have a hardened steel guide bushing at the bottom, and then the quill is larger up here at the top and runs right on the quill housing. And that's where, as far as I can tell, what's happened is because this machine is like 1978 and never got used, I've had this apart twice now thinking it was more of this gunk in there, and I've come to the realization that what's most likely going on is that this iron casting has normalized over time, and warped slightly out around and it's pinching the top half of the quill and this is what I think like I've had this all apart twice it's not that big a deal to yank apart pull the quill out and I think needs to have like a hardwood mandrel made with lapping compound and lap the top half of this quill housing it moves perfectly free in this hardened sleeve down here because I've had the quill out and the hardened sleeved slid them on each other there's absolutely no problem there 
Um, this is the awesome power feed system it's got on the quill. Really slick, infinitely variable DC power feed. And you can either flip this lever in and be disengaged here. This one engages the motor to the gearbox, and this one engages the gearbox to the quill. So you've got this slick... Um, I can't do it with one hand to get find the notch to flip it over. But anyways, you can you have this slick, nice, accurate hand down feed you can use on the quill, or you can engage this and then use power down feed. Now the quill is sticky enough right now that it doesn't like to drive it because it's not super high torque and the quill is a little too sticky for it. But anyways, um, let's see here. What else should I be telling anybody about this? It's got a uh, Bezier mist system on the back i have never hooked it up or used it i don't believe it's ever been used um i mean i can show you like here's the air inlet i mean hard to get a picture in here but it's like squeaky minty clean in there i just don't think it's ever been connected um and no evidence of any gunk or sludge in it so and then it's wired right in it's got its own control um coolant yeah mist on and off up there, um, like I mentioned, it's got an automatic oil pump in the knee. Um, inside this housing, I guess can't get that open all the way. There's, I'm trying to remember now, I had to do some rewiring in there because this thing was originally set up, oh yes, for 208 volt control. And so I was running on 240 volts, so I had to go in and bypass this transformer because that was a 208 to 240 volt converter so I had to bypass that because I'm running it straight on 240 volt um, and then I've got it wired for low voltage on the motor right now um, but anyways you can see the table is spotless few little like scuff marks but no drill marks no mill marks really really nice and clean um, everything is tight it works good the column let's see if I can get a shot of that like you can see it's gunky it's got more of that oil gunk residue on it but just perfect flaking everywhere on this machine Let's see if i can get my flashlight on it yeah i mean look at this this is like as brand new as i think i have ever seen on a machine so anyway really nice machine i just realized that i don't have this thing connected to power right now because i had this cord run all the way across my shop to the phase converter it was in my road um if you want to hear it spin I could run that back over. I mean, it sounds and runs just as good as any new machine does. It has four spindle bearings in this machine. Um, number 40 taper, which, once again, you can see, you look at the uh, nose of this thing. I don't know if I can get a picture up in there, but, like, just brandy new. No beaten battering on it. And then uh, I tore the took the spindle out of it washed out the spindle bearings and repacked them with high speed high temperature grease uh before i ever even powered this machine up just because i know that grease gets old and hard and uh i didn't want to smoke some basically brand new spindle bearings by running it with those so anyways i guess if you got any other questions um oh so this is one of the things i was going to explain so because this was a duplicator machine they didn't put any table locks on. Now, it's been a while since I looked, but I looked at a standard Millmaster 122, and as I recall, somewhere here on the front, it has a hole drilled and tapped that is designed to push on, you know, here's the gib up under here, and that just pushes on the gib much like a bridge port does. So I had figured the thing to do was slide the gib out, get a drill guide block here, and probably some pictures on the internet. You could even find the spot they did it if you cared. Drill and tap it for that. Now, where it gets a little funnier, and the part that I hadn't ever taken the time to figure out, is I don't know what they used for a lock between the saddle and the knee, because this is just totally different than anything that Bridgeport did. And I'm a little bit lost. I, I hadn't ever taken the time to figure out how a guy should go about adding a table lock. I spent a little time wondering about it and had even considered, because it's timing belt drive, um, actually <laughs> rigging something up using, as part of why I kept this hydraulic motor, is gutting it and basically using its guts with a turn knob as a lock. Because it's timing belt drive with a ball screw with no backlash on it, and you could make a pretty slick, like, 
really positive knee lock that way. So that was one cons possibility I had considered. But And then the only other thing that I had forgot to mention the other day on the phone, so these have what's a hydraulic cylinder that raised and lowered the knee. Now they do have a screw in there, and you've got a knee crank that goes in just like that. But where it gets funny is that because they had a cylinder involved with it, they only gave it about six inches of travel, if I remember correctly, on that Acme screw that's in there. And I believe the reason for that was so that it didn't bottom out in the hydraulic cylinder. Uh, bridge ports that were duplicators did the same thing. So I was using it that way. What it does is it limits how far you can raise the table. I was cheating and I was just using, you can actually raise that hydraulic cylinder by running the knee up, putting a wood block under it, and then lowering the knee back down and effectively sucking the cylinder out of its bore and then putting, uh, it's got a uh, flange on it, and I was putting uh, like one, two, three blocks under it to hold the table, give me that extra height. But anyways, the ultimate solution would be to get rid of that hydraulic cylinder and put in a longer length um, Acme screw. Now, if this mill is set up with a vise on it and it's primarily doing vise work, I'm not sure that even matters because the only time that it's been a concern is if I'm trying to clamp stuff straight onto the table and then I had, uh, say, I couldn't reach my table without putting the extending the quill further than I wanted to. But like I said, if uh, you were talking about setting it up for basically one job, um, then I don't even know that I would mess with that because I think if you spaced up the cylinder like I was describing, which I'm not doing a very good job of, but I could explain that better, but it could it easily can reach the quill at that point because that hydraulic cylinder was capable of lifting the table full travel. So if you just block the cylinder rod up a bit under the flange with a nice square block, you can basically give it six inches worth of range of motion anywhere that you want that to be. If that's a problem, then the solution is going to be getting a hunk of Acme rod from McMaster or something and just making a new lift screw that's a full length one and getting rid of the hydraulic cylinder and replacing it with a hunk of heavy wall tube with the uh, nut mounted in the end of it. But anyhow, that's everything that I can think of on this machine. And uh, yeah, so there it is. Gorton 122 Trace Master slash Mill Master.